All right, I guess we're about ready to start. Um, my name is Eric Anhold. I work at Intel's Open Source Technology Center. Um, I originally worked on the entire stack from X Server 2D, kernel, 3D driver, the whole works. These days, I get to work on just OpenGL, and it's pretty nice. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, what we've been working on, what we're planning on working on coming up, um, and then a little bit about what matters to GStreamer. Um, one of the most important features that has happened uh, for the next Mesa release is multi-sampling. Uh, multi-sampling is a feature, it's like doing super sampling to get anti-aliasing except that we only run your fragment shaders once for the whole pixel. So you get partial coverage that gets you anti-aliasing effects, but it avoids costing you a bunch of extra computation to get your rendering. Um, it is still like super sampling in that it sucks up a lot more memory, eats more memory bandwidth. Um, so there is a pretty significant cost to it. We think we've measured like 50% performance hit from turning on super, for, sorry, turning on multi-sampling. Um, this is something that actually was supposed to be in GL 3.0 that we released this spring. Um, but it turns out that multi-sampling was available in GL 2.0, but optional. And in GL 3.0, they made it mandatory by changing one character in the spec from minimum number of samples of one to minimum number of samples of four. So as we were going to release, we you know wrote some tests to make sure that all these values were at the right number. And it's like, we need four multi-samples now? We can't do that in two days. <laughs> so we punted and uh, we got it done for this release. Uh, we have 4x multi-sampling on Gen 6, also known as Sandy Bridge, um, and 8x on Gen 7. So we actually have relatively smooth looking rendering now. Um, the other big project has been GL 3.1. Um, up until this point, OpenGL has always remained backwards compatible. You could run GL 1.0 applications on your brand new driver for brand new hardware and it would work. Um, and this is absurd because there were things that they did in GL you know, 1.0 and 1.2 that you really, really don't want to use. Um, so in GL 3.1, they said, okay, uh, nobody likes this stuff. We all wish it would die, but we can't break backwards compatibility with a bunch of old apps for some people. So what we're going to do is we're going to add support for contexts to drop all of the old stuff by default. And your driver can choose to implement this extension called GLARB compatibility that puts all that old junk back in. But they made it optional. So some people, such as Apple, decided we just won't do that. If you want to write apps for uh, Apple platforms, you have to do GL 3.1 if you want GL 3.1 features and no old functionality. Um, we saw that they had done that and we said, that's great. I've always wanted to drop this functionality. So there's no more accumulation buffers, no more GL begin, no more GL draw pixels, no more GL text end. All this old stuff you shouldn't be using um, is now ripped out of the GL 3.1 context. Now we do still implement them in GL 2 context. So if you just ask for GLX create context like you've always done, you get a GL2 context, and it has the same functionality it always did, um, or a GL3.0 context. Um, but in order to get the new functionality in 3.1, you have to explicitly ask for 3.1, and by doing so, you acknowledge that, yeah, you don't get the old junk anymore. Um, there's some significant upsides to this. I pushed a patch series uh, this weekend where uh, with GL 3.1, now that this old functionality is gone, I don't need to allocate a bunch of static buffers for supporting them. So it shaves like 15 megabytes off of every OpenGL context uh, just by asking for 3.1 instead. Uh, they also added some actual features to GL 3.1. It wasn't just removing junk. Um, texture buffer objects are, um, if you wanted to reference some huge pile of data in your shader, what you had to do before, your texture limits were, you know, 0 to 20, 48 in each dimension. So if you wanted some big array, people would have to pack it into a 2D texture and figure out what X and Y to reference to get at their 
1D array that we're trying to read. Uh, texture buffer objects give you a different option where you can bind this special kind of buffer texture that's backed by a GL buffer object, where you can actually index from zero to the size of the buffer. Um, and your buffers can be like, I don't know, 512K or something. Um, relatively large arrays that you can access from your shaders. You don't get any texture filtering on them, so there's no interpolation going on. It's just array access. They also added um, something that really feels a lot like texture buffer objects. I can't quite figure out why they did both. Uh, uniform buffer objects let you take some set of your uniforms that you have in your shader, the, the data that's constant for every invocation of your shader. And instead of setting all of those through GL uniform 4F you know, with my four values or GL uniform matrix with my pointer to my matrix, uh, you can now say, this whole block of things is stored in this buffer object over here. Whenever you need to reference my uniform, pull it from this buffer object. Um, and then it's up to the driver to do something sensible there, figure out whether to load that whole block into registers at shader invocation or whether to do actual memory accesses every time you ask for it. Um, but it, it gives you the control now, instead of every time you change your shader parameters, having to go through each one of those and say uniform 4F, uniform 4F, uniform 4F, now you can just bind your buffer object. Uh, a lot of game vendors are very excited about this. The other big project has been uh, GLESS 3.0. This was just announced at SIGGRAPH a week or two ago. Um, it's the follow-on to GLESS 2. What they did this time, like how GLESS 2 took GL2 and chopped a bunch of stuff out. This time they took GL 3.3 and chopped some stuff out. Uh, there's no geometry shaders, there's no texture buffer objects, there's no multi-sample texturing, but almost everything is still in place. Unlike GLESS 2, where they took GL 2 and chopped, I don't know, all the texture formats except for RGBA 8 out, practically. Um, this time they've left in almost all of your texture formats, almost all of your shading language. Um, a lot of things are in GLESS 3. It looks like the embedded subset API that you actually wanted, not the one that you got in GLESS 2. Um, I think it should be implementable on most hardware. Um, the only really interesting hardware requirement I can think of um, beyond GL2 is transform feedback and multi-sampling, uh, both of which I think most hardware is able to do. Uh, however, of course, the, G the Kronos ARB decided to add in some new features that no hardware has. Uh, this one is ETC2. It's a new texture compression format that they're hoping will take the world by storm. It's better compression than last time with better quality. Um, it's really exciting, except that we haven't shipped hardware that does it. So um, this is our probably our biggest remaining challenge for doing GLESS 3 is that we need to take ETC data coming in, turn it into something we can actually reference in our hardware so that we can expose GLESS 3 on hardware before ETC 2 um, is supported. So we're hoping to do this somewhere around, you know, the next Mesa release. Um, and the biggest obstacle is that we don't have testing for it. Um, Kronos is working on a test suite, but I don't think it's finished. So for us to implement GLESS 3, well, we won't know if we've implemented GLESS 3 until we have tests for GLESS 3, so we need to go write a pile of tests for it. Um, and that's why that's going along slowly. Uh, the other big project is performance. Um, we're getting a lot of comparisons these days of our driver to other drivers, um, particularly across open and closed source. Um, and this happens, you know, for all of the open source drivers. There's um, one thing we've discovered recently that all the closed source drivers do and Mesa does not, which is threaded GL dispatch. Instead of having all of your OpenGL driver work in the same thread that's calling OpenGL to do rendering, what other drivers do is they take your OpenGL call, log it into a ring buffer, and tell some other thread, hey, there's an OpenGL call here that you should execute. So you fill up both your cores with work, one with your driver work, one with your application's work. And the hope is that 
you get more out of that than the cost of storing those commands into memory. Um, unfortunately, we're probably going to do this for GL3.1 only because the pre-GL3.1 core API is so huge that we don't want to attempt that. So this is another reason that um, we're excited about 3.1 core, that it lets us implement new functionality with uh, less work. Um, another performance topic uh, that's been pretty hot is better memory mapping. Um, this is interesting for GStreamer 2. Right now, if you want to upload textures, say your video frames, you can either pass a pointer to memory to GL text image 2D, and that just mem copies it into GPU memory. Or you can make a pixel buffer object, map the buffer object, and store your data in there, and then tell GL text image 2D out of this buffer object. If you're lucky, if that buffer object contains data in the right format, and it has the right stride, and you don't reuse it too soon, then you might get zero copy texturing. Um, oh, and the driver has no way to tell you what the stride should be or what the format should be. So um, right now, you know, texture uploads, if you're trying to stream texture data, uh, is pretty unpleasant. What if we let you just map your textures? Um, there's no real reason we couldn't. We, that's what we do in the driver. We map the texture memory and we write into it. Um, despite the tiling that occurs to your memory, we have um, support in the hardware where there's this aperture, in, this PCI aperture that you know, rearranges your memory accesses so that the tiling happens. So we can hand you a linear mapping to, to your texture even if it is in a tiled format. Um, similarly, what if you could map your render buffer in order to, you know, take your GL surface that you're rendering video data to and go draw some software, you know, overlaid controls on top of that. Um, there actually is an existing extension for this one, uh, EGL KHR Lock Surface 2. Um, the API is kind of wonky. Um, the two formats it lets you ask for is RGBA 8, and I think 1565 format. So uh, pretty inflexible, but you can take your existing surface and ask what is the format of it and map it, and hopefully it's a format you understand. Um, so we should get on this and let you actually map your surfaces. Um, probably the biggest thing we're thinking of for our actual rendering performance as opposed to you know, memory management and CPU overhead is the LLVM shader compiler. Um, up until this point, we have written our own compiler uh, from scratch. We did, you know, Lexer and Parser through Yak and Lex. Uh, we've built our own IR. We've built optimization passes on that IR. We built a backend IR per, for each of our driver backends. We translate into that. We do optimizations on that. We do code generation out of our IR. Uh, we've written a lot of code for our compiler, and there's still a lot of code yet to be written. It feels like every time I'm looking at some new optimization that I need to do, I say, oh, I've written about half of a compiler now. I just need to write that other half, and we'll finally be done. Um, maybe instead we should go use a real compiler and stop writing our own. So I'm poking at uh, doing LLVM now. It looks pretty interesting. Um, it's a lot of work. LLVM is a very large project with a high barrier to entry, um, but the Radeon guys are using it, and I think I probably will manage to as well. Um, we're also spending a lot of time now on Windows versus Linux performance comparisons, figuring out, you know, what what is our driver at relative to another driver for our hardware, and if they're faster, let's figure out what's going wrong and why. Uh, looking at the future after our next release, um, GL 3.2 and beyond. Uh, we haven't really talked in our team a whole lot about GL 3.2, mostly because geometry shaders are a lot of work, we think. Um, and we really want to resolve how we build our compiler backends before we go building yet another backend for a new uh, rendering stage. Uh, the other major piece of functionality is that you can actually 
texture from multi-sampled surfaces now. Before, there was no way to access multi-sampled data. You could render to multi-sampled, and then you could resolve that into a single sampled buffer, but you could never poke at your actual data. Um, interestingly, we probably won't ever release GL 3.2. Because the OpenGL specifications are all basically, here's some set of OpenGL extensions that used to be optional. For this GL version, those extensions are now mandatory. They're folded into the spec. Um, we've implemented almost all of the extensions for GL 3.3 already. So the moment we hit GL 3.2, we'll probably also turn on GL 3.3. Um, GL 4.0 will be a little while after that. Um, it's got two more shader stages again. This is the tessellation and hole shaders that let you send down a triangle and some parameters that say, actually, this triangle needs to be a rounded surface. We want to divide it up you know, this many times and get nice, smooth, pretty rendering. Um, that's going to be a bunch of work again. Uh, they also expose doubles in the shaders at that point. We've never handled doubles in our shaders before, so that will be an adventure. Uh, it's, sizes of types will be something other than four for the first time. Uh, and they also do a sort of interesting variation on function pointers in your shaders. You can have a collection of functions and through a uniform, choose which of your functions is run when you make the function call. Um, you can't choose to run different functions based on if statements or anything. You have to do a uniform jump to one of them. Um, and this is because you're running eight pixels at a time. If they made different choices, which function do you jump to? So to bring things a little on topic, what do we want from GStreamer? Um, the most important thing to me is ask for GL 3.1. If you have the option of using any version of GL, please use 3.1 or better. If you ask for 3.1, we're allowed to give you a 3.3, 4.0, whatever context, but we can't give you one of those unless you ask for at least 3.1. Uh, that's because of the deprecated functionality that was removed. Um, however, of course, don't forget to fall back to creating old contexts if they're not supported because the the implementation is allowed to just say no. Um, give us time to do threaded work. So make try to reduce uh, GL gets. Uh, once we do threaded dispatch, every GL get will be a synchronization on this other thread that's doing work and making sure that we get its queue all flushed out so you can get a correct value from GL get. So uh, going forward, this might become a performance problem for some applications. Um, seems unlikely to be a problem for GStreamer. And the big thing is use GL more. Uh, it would be really great to see our pipelines run entirely on the GPU from decode all the way through presentation instead of you know, doing decode into an XPix map that we then bind as a texture and do some color space conversion maybe. Um, you know, actually, let's run this stuff through OpenGL now that we have the ability both on the GL side of passing EGL images around between contexts, but also on the GStreamer side of being able to actually talk about things that aren't just a pointer. Um, another uh, interesting sort of direction we're going with GL on Linux is GLX is pretty much deprecated at this point. Um, there are some new extensions still coming out, but Pretty much every new extension is mirrored by an EGL extension to do the same work. Um, you're going to have to write EGL code anyway for your Android support, for your, you know, I think you can do it on Mac these days. Um, you're writing EGL code anyway. Don't bother writing GLX code. Just use that. EGL also gives you the ability to select um, different types of contexts better. You can do GLES or desktop GL and make those decisions at runtime. Uh, EGL for Wayland, too, yeah. Um, please, please stop using GLX. Um, and if there's something you need that's in GLX, please tell us, because we don't think there's anything left. Um, and the other piece we really need in GStreamer is we need to link GStreamer BAPI up to GStreamer plugins GL so that you can actually 
run things through a hardware pipeline instead of downloading at some point. Yeah. Do we have sources for DMA buffs? If you don't, like, you know, do I have some way to test DMA buffs on my system that doesn't have another GPU on it? But from user land, how do I? Get a DMA buff. No, we need to produce RAM. But so, so the prime, the prime bits are upstream. So you can use like Nouveau or something. Yeah, they have very two different two different buffs. We have one plus between them. We do prime over and hearing that. Yeah, the stuff that's missing is the defense and validation stuff. The stuff where you know that you have some other way to produce or to produce the data for the buffer. So is there a way to produce DMA buffs outside of a particular hardware driver? Um, I'm thinking, like, how do we write tests for a GL DMA buff consumer without some, you know, actual provider that's guaranteed to exist on every platform? Yeah. Most of our engineers tend to end up with Intel only graphics chips in their hardware just because having, you know, GPU switching stuff tends to be a pain in the ass. <laughs> So do you have, is there a spec that exists for uh, EGL uh, DMA buffs? There's a proposal, and last I saw, not regular, yeah, we should send that to Mesa. Yeah. 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 Would you? Um, so preparing for this, I started looking at the state of GST plugins GL, um, and it's not so hot. It turns out it doesn't even build on current auto tools, uh, so nobody's really poked at this module in quite some time. Uh, the good news is that uh, some contributor that I'm not sure if any of us knew beforehand um, has come up with a 1.0 branch uh, located at some GitHub repo. Um, been ported to 1.0, and he's done a bunch of work on actually doing the meta support for putting parameters into the meta so that you don't have to do resolves of your rendering at every stage of your pipeline, um, and done some work on putting images into the, uh, the GST buffers instead of using pointers. Um, it seems like at this point that just ought to be merged. If the GST plugins GL is dead otherwise, um, let's work on that code instead. Um, another couple of notes that I had from reviewing GST plugins GL. Um, as of GL 3.0, you don't need to make an X window anymore. So if your goal is to do offline rendering, to do some middle part of your pipeline for color space conversion, or maybe you're eating from your hardware decoder and then doing filtering in the middle and then you want to do a software encode at the end. Um, you don't actually need to make an X11 window to make your GL context anymore. Um, this is the, in EGL there's 
an extension you look for that talks about surfaceless context, and in GLX, it's just the GL 3.0 context creation extensions that do this. Um, there's also a new extension that came out of um, partially the last GStreamer event I went to, um, GLX Mesa Multithread Make Current. Uh, this is a custom extension that we wrote that, as far as I know, is only in Mesa. Um, one of the irritating things about OpenGL is that you have this context that's attached to your thread that's an implicit argument to every GL command you make, and that context can only be in one thread at a time. If you're something like GStreamer, where you want to be able to run your elements functions from multiple threads without doing any synchronization before you migrate to a new thread, uh, this gets you in a lot of trouble because you have to re you have to unbind your context at any time you might get put in a new thread for your next call. Uh, unbinding your context is really expensive. So what GLX Mesa multi-thread make current says is uh, we removed the error return when you try and bind a context into multiple threads. Uh, that was the total code written for the extension. Uh, the synchronization is entirely up to you. You need to make sure that you do multi mutexes across your GL calls to make sure that two people don't enter your context at the same time. But you're used to this. You've done this before. Um, so it seems like a pretty trivial software change, both on our end and on GStreamer's end. And it means that you don't have to ship all of your GL rendering to a single thread that talks to the OpenGL implementation, uh, which is the current state of GST plugins GL. Um, hopefully that should reduce a bunch of overhead and make writing code a lot nicer in the GL plugins. Um, and I've been getting a lot of questions about Left 4 Dead, and it was suggested that I should probably talk about what's going on there just because everybody's interested. Um, so we went up and visited Valve in Seattle um, and have started working with them on porting their games to Linux. This is amazing news for us. It's the first you know, interaction with a major game vendor that we've ever had, and it's probably the biggest game vendor on Linux. Um, so the amazing results from going up and meeting them, they gave us their code. Um, I have all of Left 4 Dead 2 on my machine. Um, and because they gave us their code, we could actually go in and fix their code instead of just complaining to them. So we fixed how they created contexts. Um, they were asking for GL 3.2 compatibility, even though they don't use GL 3.2 for compatibility. Um, we fixed a texture sampling bug they had where they were asking for a deprecated sampling mode that costs a bunch of extra work on our hardware. And we said, you actually meant this other thing. Look at, here's this comment that says, we're trying to implement this D3D clamping mode. And they just chose the wrong one on the GL side. Um, and we can actually push changes back to them. Uh, they've said, when you have changes, push them into this perforce tree and tell us that you've made changes. Um, so that's pretty cool. It's the first, it's the most open interaction we've had with any game vendor ever. We also, of course, gave them our source code. And their reaction was, this is amazing. I've never had this visibility before. They were blown away by being able to actually backtrace into a graphics driver. And while we were sitting up there working with them, they were debugging some problem they had with a performance issue on another driver where they're saying, performance drops once I, this parameter goes above 256 kilobytes. I wonder why that is. Why, why should this matter? I don't understand. And they couldn't get below their GL call in inspecting what's going wrong with their application. Um, with us, we actually were able to put in you know, code in our driver for bad performance issues. They could breakpoint on that and see exactly what the state of their application was at the point where we're doing something nasty to them. Um, and you know, again, they were just amazed that they could say, we should get some performance you know, issue printfs from you. And then we just handed them to them. Um, at the moment. Valve has reached performance parity uh, between their OpenGL stack and their DirectX stack. This was on the, their Linux blog that they have. Um, 
We're not at performance parity yet on our driver. We're working on that. Um, we're learning all sorts of interesting things about how our hardware is not perhaps what we dreamed of. <laughs> um, we also have one known rendering bug left, um, which you'll probably see in a moment here. So this is Left 4 Dead 2 running under OpenGL on Linux. Um, this guy is not supposed to be blue. That one's not supposed to be purple. Um, so we're working on building a bunch of tools so we can actually uh, you know, capture a frame of GL rendering from this application and then go drill down to figure out what actual OpenGL calls made up the rendering of that arm. Um, so yeah, API Trace is the tool we're working on. Um, but the problem with API Trace right now is that you start API Trace at the start of the application, it logs everything. You get to the frame you want and you have 20 gigabytes of data and then you have to replay through that every time as you're trying to debug your problem. So glad we never had that problem with the frame reload. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're building the tools so we can actually debug applications better. Um, the feature for API Trace is trim. Um, the idea basically came out of Git Bisect of wouldn't it be nice if I could just take some trace of OpenGL that shows a problem and have this application cut a bunch of it out and ask me, is your rendering still garbage? Um, we're not there yet at all, but uh, the tools are slowly progressing in that direction. Right now you can ask to cut a specific range of calls or a specific class of calls out of your um, API trace. And that can help you with your, you know, reduce some of the noise in your trace, cut down the size, improve the performance as you're trying to debug your problem. Um, and the next step is to, to be able to, once you cut out a draw call, cut out all of the things that were needed just for that draw call and no others so that you can start dropping out textures that you don't need for the problem you're looking at. Um, we've done this by hand uh, for some bugs, and it's proven invaluable. Bugs where I've spent a week staring at this application, staring at printf logs and things, trying to figure out what's going on, and we just cut out calls one after the other until we got down to one S3TC texture that was rendered wrong. Um, Hopefully we can do this without going by hand every time because Left 4 Dead 2 makes a lot more calls than Everwinter Nights does. So yeah, um, that's uh, the update on OpenGL on Linux. Any questions? So um, the most exciting thing about, I mean, it's exciting to finally have games on Linux, yes. But also for us, it's a workload that should be at performance parity Linux and Windows that is not right now. That's something that people actually want to run, unlike a lot of games that we work with. Um, <laughs> it's something that's actually popular, that actually matters to people. This is something where any performance issue with it, any rendering issue with it, is something that we definitely should be fixing. Um, and having something very concrete like this is exciting. Um, in terms of what uh, their team can offer us, um, so far it's been you know, recommendations, ideas for ways that our driver can help them get their uh, development job done, like the performance debug, which it turns out that we're using ourselves now all the time uh, to debug other applications. Um, and the threaded dispatch was another idea that came out of them where they said, guys, you're not doing threaded dispatch. What are you thinking? Um, so uh, that's most of what I see coming from them, although once they have some time to actually look at our driver, I think they are interested in, um, you know, looking at 
what they're hitting in our driver with their application and potentially tuning the driver for that. Um, Valve has suggested that they're open to the idea, but that team is very, very busy right now. I don't think they've made any public release dates. Um, so you're saying they don't use? <laughs> I may have heard a date. <laughs> that's, that's why I asked it that way. <laughs> so, so uh, when we are, uh, I guess you said this, I guess lagging behind a bit in terms of the. Uh, So that was actually one of the really interesting results um, from them. The problem with DirectX is that they actually change the API from version to version. And they know what their customers run. They get a lot of feedback through Steam as to what configuration the customers are using. So they know that they need to support DirectX 9 capable hardware. So they write games to DirectX 9. Even though DirectX 9 is a crufty old API you don't want to use. So the way they implemented the OpenGL port is that they implemented enough of DirectX 9 to get the job done, um, but using optionally newer GL functionality. So they're actually able to get better performance through GL because they're able to use this API that is backwards compatibility, take advantage of new functionality when available but not rely on it um, without writing their renderer three times. Um, so, you know, the fact that we're not at GL 4.3 right now um, is not really a problem to them because their application is only using GL 2.0 functionality except for ARB sampler objects from GL 3.3 that we implement um, and some, you know, other miscellaneous extensions. There's some multi-sample stuff they do. There's, you know, a few other things that they optionally use, um, but they don't have to force that. I hope so. I mean, we're moving faster than they're shoving out new specs at this point. So, you know, trends look good. Um, and on the GLESS front, it's pretty exciting to us that we were actually able to be at SIGGRAPH when they announced GLESS 3 and say, yes, open source will have GLESS 3, and here's a branch that can run a GLESS 3 app uh, right now available. Um, so. You know, this is sort of a sign that GL and Lynx is catching up, that we're actually able to get work done for the next spec before the spec comes out even. Um, it's just for desktop GL, we're starting even farther behind. Unfortunately, the transition to LLVM looks pretty ugly because ultimately at some point you turn off the old compiler backend and turn on the new one. Um, and last time it took a long time to recover from that just because of miscellaneous regressions. And um, we have a lot more testing this time and we should by then have a lot more application-based testing where we're taking API traces of applications and making sure you don't know, run them every night, make sure they render the same thing. So I'm hoping that we can do better on regressions changing backends this time. Um, but it's still not something I look forward to. Yeah, it's a big flag day and we'll leave compatibility in for a while so that you can do A-B testing on them. Um, it's, there's still a bunch of open questions for how to do LLVM. Um, and there's sort of two major for the biggest problem, which is uh, structured control flow, there's two options. The problem with structured control flow 
a GPU is running eight versions of your program in parallel, you know, loaded into one register. So when you have an if statement that's going to take path A or path B, what the hardware does is it runs path A and path B and writes your results only in the channels of the shader that were active at the time. LLVM has no concept of this. LLVM has go to and conditional go to. So for a GPU driver, we have to somehow take, you know, we take our structured control flow that we have in our GLSL, we turn it into LLVM IR, and then coming out the back end, we have to look at the structure of the program in LLVM and say, oh, there's a conditional branch to here, and then a conditional branch from there out, and an unconditional branch to the bottom. That looks like if then else. Um, this has been done a bunch of times. AMD has one in their R600 driver that can CFG structurizer. Um, LLVM projects have done these before. There's one that does an amazing project that takes C code, compiles it through LLVM, and out into JavaScript. So of course, JavaScript doesn't have go-to either, so they had to do conflow, control flow structurizing again. Um, and then people have done this in the movie industry. A bunch of people have done control flow recovery. Um, it's merely a bunch of work. Uh, the other option that's interesting, um, and this came out of an Intel researcher, he said, recovering control flow seems really hard. What I'll do is I'll execute both channels, and then I'll do a merge at the end of the two values that were produced out of the two channels using the conditions that were used for jumping into each shader. Um, an interesting option. It should be a lot easier, um, but at a potential cost. Yeah, because you, you're not sharing the registers while you're in both sides, and then you're doing this merge that's you know playing with a bunch of condition flags and things afterwards. Well, as long as you you know have some pixels in A and some pixels in B, you run both of them twice. That's the only way GPUs work. Um, and then the optimization is just that if all the channels decide to jump to B, you jump to B without executing A. Um, which always surprises people writing shaders when they have if statements. It's like, it seems like I should be jumping past this and I'm not getting any performance win from using an if statement. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>